in what I'm doing. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every every praise, every every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise. If you are God, Hallelujah,
you walked into 2016. In this new year, there is freedom. There is freedom. Hallelujah. There is freedom. Hallelujah. There is freedom. There is freedom. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Father. Hallelujah. There is freedom. Lord, 
studying in the Word, and I'm a week ahead of y'all in Around the Word, I got into the book of Leviticus, and a lot of times there's not a lot of good stuff up in there, but I got into Leviticus where God gives the instructions regarding the tabernacle, the place where His glory was to abide, while the Jews were traveling out as they were waiting to get into their land of promise. And God gives them this very peculiar instruction. He said, once a year, right after the Passover, rededicate this tabernacle to me. Make atonement for it again. And he goes through and he says, and the priest, before he will walk in, before he will walk into the tabernacle to rededicate it, to offer and to sprinkle the blood upon the sides of the altar and to smear it upon the horns, he said, the priest is to go to a, to a spring of clean water. That's a tall order out in a desert. But God promised it, that there would be a spring because he wouldn't give an instruction that they could not fulfill. He said, you're going to go to a spring, and there you're going to bathe yourself. You will remove all of the linen, all of the garments. You will get down in the water, and you will wipe wash and you will wash and let me tell you I believe that God is saying dedicate this house yet again this house yes this house too brick and stone and carpet and wood but God is looking at you and he says come back again rededicate the tabernacle where my glory dwells and wipe it clean I want you right now just come on just start just figuratively almost Wipe away last year's regrets. 
Wipe away last year's disappointments. Wipe away last year's lost and dreams and plans that were made that you didn't see come to pass. Wipe them off. And now put on your priestly garment, the garment of praise, and come and take the blood of the Lamb and place it upon the four horns of the altar and realize he makes all things new. And so, Lord, right now, Father, over this house, we wipe off last year. We wipe off our disappointments. We wipe off, Lord, discouragement. We wipe off, Lord Jesus, depression. We wipe off illness and prayers that weren't answered, Father. We wipe those off. And Father, we thank you that, God, we can because you have provided a stream in the wilderness a place of refreshing. And Father, I thank you, the Lord, that as we wash clean under the water of the Word, that we are renewed, we are transformed, and that we are yet again a dedicated tabernacle where the glory of God comes and abides. We dedicate this temple you, Lord. Let your glory fill this sanctuary. Be enthroned on the praises of your. This is your house. 
2017 is our fifth year and in the scripture five is the number of grace it is when God says all that stuff you shouldn't have done back yonder grace I don't even know what you're talking about the mistakes the regrets disappointments from this point forward they are gone he has taken each of them and has cast them as far as the east is from the west hear me my brother this is a word for you as far as the east is from the west stop trying to dig them up they're not there refreshing and cleansing a spring in the wilderness in the name of Jesus now in Jesus name a spring in the wilderness now in Jesus name a spring in the wilderness now wash yourself man of God wash yourself wash yourself man of God Oh, let your glory fall. Let your glory fall. And every single time that they would observe that ceremony, God would do exactly what he did the first time. A blazing fire would descend from heaven and would come down upon the place of atonement in the most holy place. And there God would dwell, and in the middle of all of their rebellion, and they was a rebellious, stubborn people just like us. In the middle of all of that, God said, I am, not I will be and not I was, I am the Lord your God, and in your sacrifice I am well pleased. Listen, 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 listen. You get in that Leviticus and you get sometimes so caught up with so many bulls and so many goats and so many sheep and this do this with the blood of the turtle dove and wring its neck and do this and do that. But I think we do that at a detriment of one other very important part in all that. At the end of every single one of them, see, that was just the ritual. God had already made up his mind before the little pigeon was to have its neck twisted. He already made up his mind. He said, it's not the blood of bulls and goats that I desire. And he said that when you do this, when you when you come and you follow my instruction, that's really what it was about. As crazy as the instruction was, and Diane, some of them instructions were just off the wall, completely crazy. It says that when you do that, when you come and when you bring that burnt offering and when you bring that wave offering and the grain offering and the drink offering and all of these thanksgiving and peace offerings, when you do that, the last line over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout the book of Deuteronomy, it says, and it is well-pleasing to the Lord your God. It is well-pleasing. So, honey, as imperfect as it is as your bull and your goat, 
you might think it's all that and then some. As imperfect as some people might say it is, the Lord says it is well-pleasing to the Lord your God. Why? Because you obey. Because you obey. There was no power in the blood of that bull to forgive. It wasn't his desire to forgive. And all he was looking for, listen, right thinking results in right behavior, and right behavior results in right position. And if you start obeying, if you change your mind, it'll change your behavior. And if you change your behavior, you'll end up right in the right place where you're supposed to be every single time. I'll preach that later. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the things the Word in the New Testament says to do that is totally off the wall and bonkers crazy is pray for people and anoint them with oil. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And people say, well, what's with that little oil? It's just a, honey, ain't nothing special about this. We went down the Kroger and bought this stuff and poured it in these little bottles. Just say, you don't have to go to Kroger. You can go to 99 cent store if you can find some there. Ain't nothing in here special. It is the act of obedience. It is not to you to heal. It is to you to obey. It is not to you to save. It is to you to obey. It is to you. It is not to you to perform the miracle. It is to you to obey. Obedience is far better than any sacrifice you will ever offer. I don't care how many thousands of dollars you drop in one of these buckets every single year. The first thing God desires is obedience. And so we obey him. And when we pray over the sick and we believe, well, God, what, Pastor, what if God don't heal him? That ain't your business. That is above your pay grade. You don't have, your butt is not big enough to fit that throne. Let him sit there. You do your job. Believe. The prayer of faith shall heal the sick. That's what it said. The Lord will raise him up. So, we're going to believe God today. And I don't want nobody praying with me that don't believe. If you don't believe, just sit on down. But if you believe, then I want you to agree with me today. Because right belief, right faith results in right action. And right action results in right position. So, we're going to pray for Grandma Dorothy tonight. And I want some people to believe and to pray God, to God and pray like it was their prayer was going to make the difference for Grandma to touch that bladder and for healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. We're going to pray today for Lisa as she's recovering from her viral infection. For Melody, too. She's been in that house. Pray for my mama. She's ill. I talked with Brother, Brother Bill today, and he's still recovering from his surgery, and they're trying to get that blood sugar down and under control. But you know what? I believe God. Pray for this man right here. Brother Sisto, we believe God with you. And what God did for my mama, he can do for you. And he will. And it's our job to simply believe him. Believe him. Believe him. Hallelujah. So come on, deacon. Do you believe God? We'll pray us through. Come on, church. Don't stop praying now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name today, God. Thank we you, Lord. Glory, God. There is no other that, no other power that can save, that can heal, that can deliver and set free but yours, God. No other name can break chains. No other name is the sick healed. And Father, we just declare that name right now over Sister. Hallelujah. We declare the name that is above every name over him, above sickness and disease. We declare that name over Mama Helga, over Lisa, over Melody, over Grandma Dorothy. We declare the rule and reign of the name of Jesus. It is greater than any sickness and any disease that can come over God's people. In the name of Jesus, by his stripes, they were healed. Yes. And we declare yes. the word of God over them today. Yes, yes. Yes. Father, we just pray, Lord God, for, for Lord God, those who are, that Lord God, those who are 
even even out there, even that'll be listening to this, Father. I pray, God, that, Lord God, not only would the sick be healed, but God, the lost would come home. I pray, Father God, in 2017 that you would begin to draw like never before, God, those who are running, those who have been away from you, those who have done everything in their power to turn their face from you. But, God, you are ever pursuing them, even this night. And we thank you, Father God, for doing it, God. Even now, we thank you, Father God, for break, for holes being broken, bonds being loosed, people being set free and walking. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for setting people in position, not just starting this night, but all throughout this year. We thank you and believe you for everything that you're going to do. We are careful to give you the praise, for it's no one else that could do it but you, God. We glorify you tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people declared, said. Just before we are seated, come on, just lift your hand one more time. Lift holy hands before the throne. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth. Let it go forth from here to the nation. Let your fragrance rest in this place as we gather to seek your oh let your glory your fragrance rest in this place as we gather to seek your oh, as we gather to seek your oh, as we gather as we gather to seek switch things all up around a little bit. Well, I think we're going to go right to the Word. We're going to go right to the Word, and then we'll take care of the offering and everything at the end. But I do not want, and you, you kind of maybe, you can feel free to stay and pad and <laughs> do whatever. I'm, I'm getting used to you over there. And Kendrick, take that. That's yours, right? Thank you, Jesus. Do you love him today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Remember, we've started around the Word in 90 days now. And so if you have not yet picked up your reading plan, pick it up out in the lobby. Today was the first day, but you do get two grace days. So if you didn't read today, then you only have one grace day left. All right. Right thinking results in right behavior. Right behavior results in right position. It's a lot of folks going through life struggling. They don't know how they're going to make it from end to end. And if you trace it all the way back to its root, and I can say that because I grew up in Pasadena. If you trace back to the beginning, it all started right here right here. They ended up in the wrong position because they started out with the wrong thinking. Oh, well, pastor, it can't be that simple. And actually, it is. As a matter of fact, 90% of what the New Testament especially, yeah, but the Old Testament as well, 90% of what this book strives to do is change the way that you think and look at things. And yet we continue to try to look at this book through natural eyes. Right? And thus we have invented this thing called religion. Right? And religion is nothing more than a natural answer to a spiritual problem. I'm glad you're trying to solve the problem. Right? That's good. At least you recognize that there is an issue and I, I can do more with somebody who recognizes something's wrong. If the, uh, uh, I am, I am Brother Allen, an aviation geek. I have always been fascinated with airplanes. I think they are just incredible. The bigger the airplane, the more fascinated I am by them. About two years ago, I had the chance to fly on the big Airbus A380. You seen that one? That's the, the double decker. It is 750,000 tons. You, can you imagine how much? I mean, this thing is massive, right? They had to redo the runway at Bush Intercontinental Airport and make it thicker to be able to support the weight of this thing. I've seen the thing last year when, I was, when we landed in London and we got stuck there because of fog. Never, don't want to, don't fly through London if you can avoid it. We, they deplaned us out on the tarmac. And after a while, we were able to get back on the plane and fly on further to Frankfurt. But as I was climbing up the stairs to go on to our little seemingly small plane by comparison, maybe about a couple of 300, 400 yards away on the runway was a massive Emirates A380 taking off. And I was thinking, how can that thing fly? Right? So I'm, fasc I'm fascinated by that. And so I'll watch these aviation shows, especially air crash things. They, the, the simple mistakes that sometimes a pilot will make that will result. If you remember a few years ago, there was an Air France jet that was flying from Rio de Janeiro to Paris and it crashed in the Atlantic Ocean. And they couldn't figure, they couldn't find it for the longest time. It took them two years to find this plane. And when they finally did, they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to recover the flight data recorders. Wrong thinking results in wrong behavior, which results in wrong position. And when they got the data recorder, the flight recorder, they were able to listen in to a conversation in the cockpit. And there was a young pilot there, a new pilot, one who had just received the certification, who should have known because the mistake he made was the most basic mistake, was the most basic elementary thing in flying an airplane. So a plane, when you fly it, the further you tilt the nose up, the slower it flies because there's no lift under the wing. So if the plane starts slowing down, you have to take the plane and angle it down because going downhill does go 
faster. And by pointing the nose down, you get lift, right? And so the plane then can recover. That Air France jet, there was nothing wrong with it. The plane operated exactly as it should have, except a young, inexperienced pilot heard some bells and whistles going off in a cockpit. The autopilot shut off momentarily, and he was in command of the plane. And the plane had, because when the autopilot shuts off, it doesn't know what to do, so it starts to descend. What does he do on the stick? Pulled back all the way. Sharper and sharper, and the harder he pulled, the faster it fell. 38,000 feet, that plane fell, and there was nothing wrong with the plane. There was something wrong with the pilot's thinking. You see, what the pilot was thinking seemed logical. If I want to go up, point the nose in the direction I want to go. But the thing that they had taught him was to make the plane go up, tilt the nose down so that it will pick up speed and so that it can go. The plane literally, with both engines running, landed belly first in the Atlantic Ocean, dooming 250 people to their death on a perfectly good $70 million airplane. Why? Wrong thinking led to a wrong behavior pulling back on the stick, which led to the wrong position, 7,000 feet underwater between Africa and South America. Hear me, I'm going somewhere with this today. Gateway of Hope, friends online, hear me today. We must make sure that we start with the right thinking so that we end up with the right behavior. See, I am not here to try to modify your behavior. As a matter of fact, a lot of churches have done that. We've tried that. You and I, we grew up in them churches, didn't we? We were told, don't do this and don't do that. No mixed bathing. Well, I was okay with that. <laughs> no dancing. No smoking. No drinking. No cussing. No chewing. No rock music. No short sleeves. No bowling. No, bow no bowling. No dominoes. I know right? And it went on. Some added to it. No iced tea. They wasn't Pentecostals. <laughs> no coffee. Don't do this. Don't do that. Religion is pulling on a stick when you're supposed to simply point the nose down. Turn with me in your Bible. We're going to go to a couple of places. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Psalm 1. And as you're turning there, and no, we're not going to put it on the screen today. Bring your Bible. First, 2 Corinthians 5 and Psalm 1. I want to talk to you today about how we make all things new. How do we make it all new? We have already mentioned it a few times in our service that 2016 was certainly a challenging year for many of us. In the life of this church, it was a challenging year. and the lives of many of our members, it was a very challenging year. For me personally, 2016 at work was an awful year. It's not a luxury item. And the economy is not good. Not in Houston. You might like it to be able to go buy your tank of gas for a buck. 75. It ain't good for our economy. That's bad, right? We need that gas to be more expensive because that's what we rely on. Margaret's back over there nodding her head. So financially, we had the downturn in the economy, work slowdowns. In the city of Houston, I think last year in January, I mentioned, it says, hang on, guys, it's going to be a rough year. And it's correct. We had 85,000 people lose their jobs in the city of Houston over this past year, have a net loss of jobs. Whereas before, the city of Houston was constantly gaining jobs. 
Texas was the fastest growing economy in the country, and the city of Houston had the fastest growing economy in the state of Texas. And this year, it just went from full throttle to full reverse. Relationships. Well, I think we can all agree that relationships have been stretched to the limit by the vitriol, the hatred, and the anger of, if for nothing else, from the political campaign that we just endured. I've had people unfriend me on Facebook because I simply made the, I made the crazy notion that some men trust in donkeys, trust in elephants, but we will trust in the lamb. But see, hyper-partisanship and... I know of people whose marriages are in trouble as a result of the election. But it wasn't the election if that's the case. Coming from the counselor over here. Thank you, counselor. That's right. But it was the straw which broke the can. Maybe it was the thing that exposed. We've, had fr we've lost friends as a result. Some people were took one side or they took another and... And so immediately it became, well, you're a communist or you're a racist and you're a bigot and you're this and you're that and you're for her and I'm for him and I'm for her and you're for him and we can't have anything to do. And so relationships were strained in the past year, right? Spiritually, I will tell you, the enemy has thrown everything he had in the arsenal, including the kitchen sink full of all the dishes didn't even bother to empty them out. The hot water heater to go with it. Through it all. I can say for my own self and for no one else, I have fought more spiritual warfare this past year than I have in a long time. And there's been times, Rose, I wanted to go, Lord, can't you get me a ceasefire for just a little while? Can't I have a truce? Can't we just? And the Lord, no. Because your enemy is not interested in a ceasefire or a truce. And if you end up getting one, it just means he's reloading. That's it. So we've had that. We've had setbacks. But folks who've lost loved ones who they didn't expect. Illness that doesn't make any sense. Financial things not panning out, even though you did everything that you believed was right. Come on, anybody here? Prayers that you were sure would be answered. You look back today, and all you sometimes say is, what a setback, what a disappointment. You see, Paul describes that. Listen to what he says, and I'm going to read from the Amplified because it, it reads it just so powerfully. And ask yourself if this is not sometimes how you felt. Verse 1, For we know what, that if the earthly tent, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. But indeed, in this house, say in this house. In this house we groan. Does that sound familiar? He's talking about this house here. Let's not confuse carpet and chairs. This house, flesh and blood. In this house we groan. Anybody groaned in the last year? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, how will I make it? Some of you sat on January the 1st of last year saying, how will I make it through this year? How can I get to the end of the year? I don't know how. Oh, God. And you groan. Longing to be clothed with your immortal, eternal, celestial dwelling. I tell you what, I can't wait. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. You know, we used to sing those songs, 
And there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, that's a little bit of, oh, I don't want to be here. It's almost a hold the fort till Jesus comes. Did y'all ever sing that one? We used to get our white hankies out and wave it. Honey, that's where I come from. Now, waving the white flag is surrender. <laughs> hold the fort. Jesus never told you to hold no fort. Jesus told you to advance, to go. What you sitting behind a wall? So, he says we groan. He says we long indeed to be clothed with our immortal, eternal, celestial dwelling so that by putting it on, we won't be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, often weighed down and oppressed. Not that we want to be unclothed, that is, that we want to die, but to be clothed so that what is mortal, the body, will be swallowed up with life after the resurrection. You see, there is sometimes an every intense longing for escape. The Jews sitting in Babylon, Brother Sisto, you're good, by the way, thank you. I, I, otherwise, I'll keep you playing the whole time. The Jews sitting in Babylon escaped one way. You know how they try to escape? Oh, how it used to be. Oh, how it was. Oh, how good we had it. Well, I remember Brother Chris back when I was back in Brother McDuff's church. We used to have church until 2.30 in the morning. We, used, we had one service where we had 85 people get the baptism and the Holy Ghost. I remember the service where we baptized 162 kids, one after the other. We couldn't hardly say. That was when we wished we was baptized in Jesus' name because it's a whole lot faster than Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We was lining up in, out, in. I remember the days. And sometimes we sit there and we just long for the old days. In Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, the, and you have to help me here, Isaiah chapter 43 my notes are handwritten tonight, so y'all pray that I have the gift of interpretation to read. <laughs> Isaiah 43, verse 14. They're sitting in Babylon. They're sitting in captivity. And here they get this word from God. It says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes, I sent an army against Babylon. I will force the Babylonians to flee in those ships that they are so proud of. You see what they're doing? They're going, oh, one of these days, it's coming, it's coming. He's going to kick some Babylonian butt. He's going to get us out of here. He's going to get us back to Jerusalem, and all will be well. Well, honey, they weren't yet well. They were still sitting in Babylon trying to escape a little bit, I guess. God goes on to say, but I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making I passed through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I, I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Oh, this is all good, man. They were starting to have church. They were starting to shout, yes. They started singing Moses' song saying, he delivered us from the hand of the Egyptians and drowned the rider and the chariots in the sea. Man, they started getting happy and thinking, about, oh, that's what it used to be. Oh, yes. And what was it? Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Good enough for me. Well, honey, that might be your problem right there. That might just be your problem right there. Because Jesus, while he did all those things, and yes, while he threw the horses and the chariots and the riders, into the sea while he drowned all of Pharaoh's army in the, in the Red Sea it wasn't what he did again as a matter of fact he's never repeated again throughout all of history and just because God did that back in Brother McDuff's church back a couple of hundred years ago or ten years ago or even last month doesn't mean that he is bound to do it that way yet again as a matter of fact, you miss what he's doing now because you're so busy looking back, going, oh, you remember that? Remember yeah, you know how good that was? Oh, that was so good. Oh, glory, 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 Jesus. See, I can't quite do it as good as you, but you can illustrate for me, right? <laughs> and then sometimes we get so caught up, oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Well, honey, what are you doing right here and right now? What are you doing right here and right now today? It's your thinking. 
You see, they're thinking on the wrong thing. Look what God says. God, after he sets them, don't you hate when he does that? Does God ever speak to you that way? He gets you all worked up. Man, he, start, he knows. He knows what will grind you up, which will get you going. And he started twisting the little screw on the back of their back. And like a little robot, did, 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 praise the Lord, 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 praise the Lord. And then God put his finger on top of their head and said, stop. Listen to what he says. But I want you to read that next line with me, verse 18. But forget all that. Say it. But forget all that. Forget about the fact that you're going to be in glory one day. Yes, you will. Your calling and your election is as sure as the color of your eyes. That cannot be changed. But forget about all that. And yes, God did. Yes, that's right, Israel. God delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. Praise God. Yes, he did rain down manna from heaven. Yes, he did send quail every single night. Yes, he was a fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Yes, he brought you into the land of Canaan. Yes, he conquered the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Mosquito Bites, and all of them. He conquered them all on your behalf. But what does he say? Forget about it. I wish Lisa was here right now. Forget about it. Or, or Paco, right? Forget about it. What's well, hard for us to do because we peg some of our hope on that. Now, it is important for you to know that God did it. Right? Because faith has a substance and an evidence. The evidence of my faith is the fact that he's done stuff for me before. And faith that has no substance and no evidence is not really faith. Right? It's just hopeful, wishful thinking. Right? But listen to what it says. Verse 18. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am about to do. Listen now. Verse 19. For I am about to do something new. Say new. No more old. No more old. New. New. No old time religion, brother. New. A new touch. A new revelation. A new picture of Jesus in your life. A new word from heaven. Not old. New. Say new. Look at your neighbor. Say new. Not no. <laughs> Carlos is always one. He says... You say, see, I'm about to do something new. As a matter of fact, I've actually already begun it. Right. Then he says, don't you see it? Yes. Can't you see him kind of pausing for a second? Like, uh, you, don't, you don't see what I'm doing? And of course, what are they saying? No. What's he doing? Don't you feel, don't you hate that when your boss does that? <laughs> My boss is notorious for doing that. He sets me up every single time, and I just walk right on in. And then it's kind of like Charlie Brown with the, well, Lucy with the football. <laughs> even now, even now I'm doing it. Don't you see it? You see, if you spend all of your time thinking about all the things that were and all the things that will be, you miss what he is doing today. Right thinking results in right behavior. Now, what, what do I mean by this right thinking? Now, I told you Psalm 1. I'm jumping a lot. This is all going to come together. This is a word from heaven today. I believe that firmly. I haven't been this worked up about a word in a long time, church. Listen now. Psalm 1, 1. Oh, the joys. Say joys. I know the religions people like to say, blessed is the mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. I got, I have the, I got the real inspired New Living Translation. You got it. All right. But in the, we've learned this in King James. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, in my NLT, it says, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. For the purposes of this message, though, I like the way the King James puts it better because it is actually closer to the original text in that regard. Blessed or Oh, joyful, happy, content, and fulfilled. Remember our lesson from the Beatitudes, the be happy attitudes? Happy and content and fulfilled is the man who does not, or woman, who does not walk in the counsel 
of the ungodly, in the advice of the ungodly. Now, what, what in the world does that mean? Counsel is thinking, right? When, when you go sit down with Brother Will over here, when the Hope Counsel Center opens up here soon, and you make an appointment with him, basically what he's going to be trying to do more than anything is not tell you what to do. He's going to be trying to shift your attention to look at things differently. Because frankly, Will, as wonderful and as awesome as he is, I will bust you back down to reality, can do, as wonderful as he is, can do absolutely nothing to change your circumstances. Your bank account will look exactly the same when you walk out as when you walk in. Actually, it might have a little bit less since you're probably, you might end up paying for the counselor. Your relationship problems at home will still be waiting for you. Your disease and your illness might still be there. All of those things, he ain't going to change none of that, but he is going to refocus where you look. Are you listening to me? Counsel is important. Therefore, be careful from whom you take counsel. Because as you start receiving that counsel, as that counsel starts coming in and it starts processing. Blah, 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 blah. All the little synapses start firing. Before long, you're going to be prone to say, hmm, that's not a bad idea. That's a pretty good idea. And it might well be in the natural. Right? Because if you think about the spiritual answers that God gave, he has given some really ridiculous spiritual answers. Take, the take a bull, cut it up in so many pieces. Take its kidneys and the lobe of its liver and put it on the altar and take the fat of the tail and lift that up and then take, a, take, a, take your flower offering that you're going to get and throw a handful of it, not, not all of it, just a token part of it, throw that and burn it on the altar. What? Can we just say, huh? Come on, go ahead. I did that more than once this week reading it. So I'm going to tell you right now, as you're reading it, the first week and a half of the, around the Word in 90 Days will be the most challenging for you because you're thinking of it with a full totality of knowledge looking back. And you've got to remember, they only had what they had. They didn't have, they didn't have all the knowledge you've got today. Right. So, so sometimes God will prescribe the most unusual and insane ways to think. Well, what do you mean? Well, people come and they say, oh, this man, I'm just in debt up to my eyeballs. By the way, I break that spirit of debt in Jesus' name. Amen. No more poverty. No more poverty. But folks come and they say, I don't know. I don't know how I can get myself out of this. And God says, okay, well, you want to get out of it? No problem. Give. Ah. Uh, yeah, no, 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 you, preacher, you didn't quite understand what I told you. See, we have this here. The accountant, he'll understand. See, we have more outflow. We have income, right? More outflow than inflow, and that's not a good recipe. That's, that's not a good recipe, is it? That's a bad recipe, right? You can't make that, Okay. And so God says, all right, you're right. You have more outflow than inflow. Great. Let some more flow out. That's right. You're kidding me, right? Give, and it will be given back to you. The prophet came to a woman who was dying. Her son was dying. She had just a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour left. She was going to make one last cake for herself and her little boy, saying, and then we're going to die because we haven't got no more. I just have enough. And the prophet walks in and says, sister, bake me a cake. I'm sure she at first thought, just like you, do that again. Do that again. Ha! Ah! Are you crazy? <laughs> she got up on the Facebook and said, this crazy preacher man, come over here. She posted a picture of her little jar of oil and her little bit of flour and said, this man is nuts. But she did it. 
Why? Because she had already had set her mind in the right place and the right thinking resulted in the right behavior. And then we know that that cruise of oil never ran out. There was always flour and there was always oil until the end of the famine and she and her boy lived before it was going to be her last cake and then they were going to do what? Die. Die. And God said, give me every last bit of what you have. Give me every last bit of what you have. Listen to me, church. The Old Testament is types and shadows. It's a, it's a schoolmaster for you to learn a lesson. If you want to break your cycle of poverty, start giving and give ridiculously. Bless and be a blessing. You make sure that every single time this bucket gets passed, don't you let it pass by you without putting something in it. Oh, well, preacher, just trying to raise the budget for the church. No, honey. The preacher's trying to help you to change the way of your thinking and get you into a right position. Because until you get out of the thinking and the mentality that I've just got barely enough and then I'm going to die, until you get out of that and into, blessed be the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, who provides good things to his children, until you get to that, you will always be broken. You will always be bankrupt. And I don't care how much money you put in the offering on this. Because it's not about how much you put in. It is the attitude with which you place it in there. It's pointing the nose down when you're trying to go up. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Doesn't let his thinking get changed. Man thinks in his heart, then so he is. As you start thinking, that's who you become. Be careful where you get your counsel from. Where should you start getting your counsel from? Why don't we start right here? We are told to put on the mind of Christ. And if you are ever in doubt of what the mind of Christ is, the good news is it's in here in ink. It's written in black and red and white. Nobody can take an eraser and change it. People through the years have tried to say it says this and says that. But he says, hey, if you got a question, I give you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. He'll tell you what it says. You're a priest and you're a king before the... Oh, my goodness. Oh, Jesus. Well, I'm preaching better than you. Amen. And tonight, come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, we will start by saying, I'll believe it when I see it. And I'm going to tell you right now, if that is your mentality and if that is your mindset, you're going to be looking a long time and you will never see it. If you're going to only believe healing, if you're only going to believe that God heals when you see healing, well, honey, you ain't going to see no healing. And if you only believe that God will provide when that check for a cabillion bucks shows up in your mailbox, you're going to keep going and ain't nothing going to be there. But my friend, it's not, I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it. It's more like, I'll see it when I believe it. When I believe, God honors his word. When I believe, God honors his word. All things are possible to them that believe. Oh, that's my water. I need that. I, I am too. All things are, not all things are possible to them that work. Not all things are possible to them that really, 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 really try really hard. All things are possible to them that believe. Now, if you have a problem with your faith, if you have a problem with your faith, the book of Romans gives us the answer. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God. I want to point you back to your book. You see, everybody's going like, man, pastor wants me to read 12 pages a day, Chris. That's a lot. That's a lot. Do he know how busy I am? Don't he know I got to get up on the Twitter? I got to get up on the YouTube? I got to get up on Snapchat? The Instagram, the kick it, 
the, uh, the, the, the Facebook, not to mention certain other social media applications. Oh, oh, I'll go there next week. <laughs> I got to do all that, Pastor Ken, and he want me to do what? Well, I got, I got, I was reading all, you know, that just, How many of you like Wikipedia? Yes. How many of you find yourself looking one thing up on the Wikipedia and about an hour later you're going like, oh my God, how in the world did I get on this subject? <laughs> you can sit there for an hour and read about some nonsense that won't impact your life at all about how Mariah Carey couldn't sing last night. I heard ISIS has claimed responsibility for, <laughs> for that disaster. But we can't get in the word. Come on, church. Start changing your mind. I'm going to tell you the only way it's going to work. We're going to make up our mind. Well, you will have to because I can't make yours up for you. But you're going to have to make up your mind that the first thing you will do every day is pull this book out. Before the phone gets turned on, before the before the computer gets turned on, before you log into the grinder, oh, did I just go there? Before I do any of that, I'm going to get this. The word, the word works. Now, guys, I know I'm, I'm throwing red meat out tonight, but you know what? This is truth. Listen, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. the word works when you yeah. work the word. Yeah. The word does nothing yeah. when you just sit it there. Oh. You need healing? He's got an app for that. <laughs> you need a miracle? He has an app for that. Yeah. You need a breakthrough? There's an app for that. Amen. You need financial prosperity? He's got an app for that. Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. You need healing in your body as an app for that. Call for the elders of the church, praying over you, anointing you with oil. The oh, prayer of faith oh, shall heal the sick, on. and the Lord will raise you up. Uh -oh, yes. Clear. Yes, yes, sir. Right. yes, sir. You have some depression? There's an app for that. I know, Jeremiah 29, the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans for blessing and not cursing. Plans to give you a hope and a future. How about you start tapping that app? Now, now that's, oh, I don't know why I put that Bible down. I need that Bible. Psalm 1 1. Stay there. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, right? Now, if you scoot down into verse 3, you see counsel yet again. You see thinking again. Listen, the first time we see what not to do, right? Blessed is the man who does not. But then you scroll down to verse number 2. But they, what? Delight in the law of the Lord, and they meditate. meditate. What is that? Can we put that in English, please? They think on it. That Greek word is a Greek word, a Hebrew word, hagath. It means to chew on it like a cow chews on its cud. Over. <laughs> chew, honey. Sometimes... Sometimes we get in a hurry with the word and we run through it like we're driving through the Burger King and we need to inhale our Whopper. Well, I checked off that. I, I ticked off that list. I read my 12 pages. Honey, I don't want you just to read those pages. I do want you to read them, and I think you can read them, but I want you to look and scour for something every single day. Every single time we're in the word, we should ask ourselves, is it okay if I, I know I'm, Going along, I, I'm hurrying, I promise you. Every time we're in the Word, we should ask ourselves, what does this mean? Yeah. Right? Intellect, right? Word interprets Word, church. Interpret the Scripture through Scripture, right? Solo Scriptura. What does it say? Second, how do I feel about it? What is it doing to my emotion? Am I convicted by it? Am I encouraged by it? 
Does it cause me sadness or rejoicing, right? We have to know what the mind, we have to deal with the heart, but then the most important, what does God want me to do? Because if you haven't heard him tell you what to do through the scripture, you hadn't read enough. <laughs> Every single time, obedience is better than sacrifice. He will always ask you for something. You see, if all you're doing is just trying to tick off a box, you're offering the Lord that costs something that costs you nothing. And I won't offer the Lord something that costs me nothing. Every single time, I will tell you, every time I open this book, every time I play my app in my car, and I listen. By the way, that's what, I, that's what I listen to. I used to listen to talk radio or to music, and I would come home, and I'd be so angry, so aggravated, because all I was filling my mind with was negative stuff. Now i got an app on my phone. It, doesn't, it, does, it downloaded the whole Bible on my phone. I don't have to use my bandwidth. I don't have to use any air time to do it. I just plug it in, I play, and I got this pretty music, and some guy reading the Word all the time. It changes my thinking. Oh, my goodness, i got to hurry here because I've, I've belabored this one point, and I, we have a lot to, to go through here. Stop saying I'll believe it when I see it and start saying I'll see it when I believe it. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Stop walking in the advice, the counsel of the ungodly. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we go through that, and I don't have time to dissect that passage all the way, my favorite verse is there, and it is our theme verse for 2017. It is the 17th verse of chapter 5. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have what? Passed away. And behold, all things, say all things. All things have become new. If all that has become new is a few things for you, then you're not in Christ. If he's got everything except your relationship, you don't got him. If he has everything but your wallet, you hadn't found him. If he's got everything except what you allow to come through these little eyes, honey, He's, you either got all of him or you ain't got none of him. And he either has all of you or he has none of you. I know this is not, I know that this is not the kind of preaching that will fill the church house full and get people to say, oh, what a wonderful place this is. But it is the absolute gospel yeah. truth. He will not share his place with anyone. None. Look in Leviticus over and over. He says, I'm a jealous God. I it's not just that you don't have the gods before me. You don't have any other gods, period. Not behind, not after, not under, none. You are not to make any graven image. You are not to bow down to anything else. You are not to acknowledge anything else. Now, are there other deities and powers out there? Of course there are. There are demonic powers and rulers of wickedness in high places. But there is no God like our God. And God says, you're to have none other, none other. Change your way of thinking. All men must be born again. And you are born again when you become renewed in your mind. You start thinking a new lot. You start, it changes you. The world says one thing, the word says another. Which should you go after? I will choose what the word says. Well, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Actually, it was settled before you believed it. It's just really good for you to go ahead and acknowledge it and believe it ahead of time because whether you believe it or not, I can believe all I want that the sky is, 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 is purple, but the sky is blue and grass is green, unless you're from Pasadena. We need to put on the mind of Christ. How would he respond? What would he say? When I'm in the middle of my crisis, when I'm in the middle of my situation, when I get the phone call, my loved one, I'm finding out, passing away. When I get that news, your, doc, your, your last CAT scan came back, and I need you to come in right away. Yeah, oh, I, I don't know, right? Meditate on it. Meditate on it. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform 
to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we renew our mind? You put the old one to death every day. He tells you in the verse that's before it. He says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice. Honey, you don't need an altar unless you plan on killing something. Altars are totally unnecessary unless something's going to die on it. So if he's telling you to crawl up on an altar, guess what he's planning to do? He's planning to put the old man to death. And not just today. You get to do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day, Brother Beard, right? Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Crosses are not necessary unless there's going to be a crucifixion. Now, the right thinking leads to right actions. You see the next thing it says? Oh, the joys of those who do not follow in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of the sinner. Standing is an action, right? It's a verb. You see, the right thinking will result in the right action. If you don't start by taking the counsel of the ungodly, you don't start hanging around with the people who are in sin. And by the way, if they're in sin, you will be before much longer too. If you think, if you think that you are going to be the positive influence on them and that you are going to go ahead and somehow pull them into glory against their will, honey, I hate to tell you this, but no, you will not. As a matter of fact, they're going to pull you to their thing. Why were the Jews forbidden to marry the Canaanites? Because you'll end up whoring after their false gods. It's why I'm spitting them out of the land, God told them over and over. Oh, Jesus. It is Sunday night. I am allowed to preach like this on a Sunday night. I would never preach like this to the Smos. No. No. Never. That's going to get me in trouble right there. You see, true faith, right? The right faith, the right thinking will result in the right work. Every bit of your thinking will result in some work. It will result in action every time. Faith without works is dead. Basically what that means, once you start thinking about it, you're going to end up doing something with it, right? If you start thinking across the, if you start getting inebriated down at the JR, sitting up, up on that three-legged stool, looking across the way, and you see some pretty little young thing come walking in, you go, hubba, hubba, hubba. Oh, my Lord, this is so nice. And then that's going to lead you to start lusting a little bit, and then you're going to come and slither up on the bar stool next to it. Say, hey, gorgeous, what's your name? You want to go, <laughs> you want to go home with me? Isn't it? Isn't that the way it ends up working? I know we've simplified it, but let's be real. Oh. Oh, folks on Facebook, pray for me here. Sam, i got to figure out how to land this plane because going back to the aviation thing, uh, we're going to start running out of fuel here for long. <laughs> no, no to, to land, i got to go nose up. Oh, Jesus. You see, you see, the right belief results in the right work. Those who sow to the flesh will reap from the flesh destruction. That's what the Word says. You take it up with the Apostle Paul and with the Holy Ghost. They're the ones who penned it. But those who, sp who sow to the Spirit will reap life. And there are works of the flesh. Read about them in Galatians. Anger and bitterness and jealousy and lust. In John, it says, or James, it says, when lust and sin have conceived, they always bring forth a baby. It's called death. A little sin will lead to a bigger sin. A bigger sin will lead to even bigger sin. And big sins kill. Oh, Jesus. He said, but if you sow to the Spirit of God, if you sow to righteousness, if you start thinking righteous thoughts, it will result in right behavior. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, patience, kindness, and self-control against which there is no law. But it all started out by what was I focusing on? What was I meditating on? Jeremiah 29. 
to for, two thousand, uh, two th for 2017 to be a productive year, you have to stop dwelling on the words of depression, the words of discouragement, the words of discontentment, because they will lead to further actions that come as a result of the depression, the discouragement, and the discontentment. You see, you need to start speaking and letting out of your mouth what he says. Start speaking good plans, not evil. Blessing, not cursing. Hope and a future. Not that I'm, me and my son are going to sit here and die. Pastor Ken, come on. Hallelujah. Right thinking results in the right action. Amen. And if you look here in, in Psalm 1-3, they are like trees planted along the riverbank. And what do they do? They bear fruit every season. How do they bear fruit every season? They're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. They're meditating on the law of the Lord, on the word of God. That's what they're focusing on. And as a result, they bear fruit. You want to stop having your, wines, your, your vines wither? You want to stop having your vines wither? Then start meditating on his word. Because then you bear your fruit in good season. It may not be tomorrow. And it might not be next week, but it will come. It's a law. It can't be changed. And finally, the right behavior will result in the right position. The young man who spent his inheritance found himself in the position of sitting at a pig trough, the worst possible place for a Jew to find himself, eating pig slop thinking that pig slop would be more desirable than going back and repenting at his father's house. How tragic. But it didn't start with him waking up one morning saying, gee, I think I'll go to the pig trough. It started with him thinking, I'm entitled to my inheritance. Well, no, you're not. Your daddy's not dead yet. Sort of went with the wrong thought. And it resulted in a wrong behavior. He went up and demanded his inheritance. Acted an ignorant fool. Spent it living riotously, the word says. Spending it on the ladies of the night. Down at the watering hole, buying around for everybody. Huh. And then he ends up at a pig trough. My friend, find yourself in a position you don't want to be in, I'm pretty sure you didn't set out saying to yourself, that's the position I want to be in. I don't think anybody in January of 2016 made a resolution. Hmm, I think this year I'm going to live in rebellion and I'm going to go and I will hug a toilet bowl every single night. Don't think folks made that. I'm not saying that every one of your circumstances are the result of sin. But have you stayed in the wrong position for too long because of the wrong thinking? See, storms will come to your life no matter what. Sometimes even when you do everything right, storms will come. Diane, it rains on the just and the unjust alike, Alan. It does. But when that storm starts blowing, how do you start dealing with it? Are you taking the wrong action when the autopilot kicks off and the alarm bells start going off in the cockpit of your life and the bells and the whistles start going? And God says, do what I taught you to do. Put the nose down. Just tilt it down. Or do you do what seems natural? Pull back with all your might saying, I can't go down! Only to find, end up landing belly up and breaking apart. My friend, it says that he shall be like a tree planted by the river of living water whose roots go down 
deep. Sometimes there ain't no water on the surface, Melinda. Sometimes you just got to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and keep letting those roots go down. It's either that or you're going to end up sitting in the seat of the scornful. You're going to end up taking your place, a position that you were never intended to take. You are to be seated in heavenly high places with Jesus Christ. Even now, even now, he is the one who was and who is and who is to come, right? And in one moment, in one, and I know we can't quite understand this, but right now he looks at your life, and you know why your salvation is so sure? Because when you gave your life to Christ, he saw your life, all of the past, all of the present, and all of the future, and he already sees you seated with him because he's already there. And you are too, you just don't know it yet. But along the way, I want to ask you, what position are you going to take? Are you going to keep bellying up to the, to the, to the hog pen? Can I just say, 2016, I think we've had enough hog slop. I think we've had enough hog slop. Enough hog slop of drama. I think we've had enough hog slop of anger and bitterness unforgiveness, pettiness, which all started right up here. And along the way, the wrong pattern of behavior resulted in wrong actions. I remember, I know now countless meetings I've had in that little tiny broom closet office of mine over there where I've talked with folks and you suddenly you see the light go off in their head and they say, oh my God, but I thought, thought. And because I thought, I, I did. And now because I did, I'm so far from where I want to be. Well, I got some good news. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, and old things become new. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Forget about it. Forget about what was. Forget about all of yesterday. Forget about the disappointments. Forget about the failures. They no longer matter. They are but a figment of your imagination. Why? Because I'm about to do a new thing and will. I've actually already started it. Don't you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Church, can you see it? Can you see what he is doing? Can you see his hand at work? My friend, yes, it was a rough year, but you didn't know how you would make it. Well, baby, you did make it. You did make it through. When you didn't know how you would pay those bills, you did end up paying those bills. Oh, Jesus. Diane, do me a favor. Back in the back. Uh, Kendrick, help Diane. Give every single person an envelope and a piece of paper. Come on, church. Open the eyes, Lord, of our hearts today to see what it is that you are doing, Jesus. Everybody take a pen and a piece of paper. Lord, have your 
Now don't write anything yet. Don't write anything yet. Pastor Ken's going to lead one up here. Thank you, Jesus. I need a paper, my dear. And of course, I need a pen, could I? Thank you, Lord. There we go. Everybody have a pen and a piece of paper and an envelope. Here's what I want you to do. On your envelope, please address it to yourself with your home address. Dress it just like you were writing yourself a letter because you actually are about to. Here's what we're going to do. Look up at me once you finish your addressing your envelope. Behold, I do a new thing. Even now it springs forth. Can you not see it? I want you right now to forget about everything that happened yesterday, last month, last year, 10 years ago, nothing. What are you believing God for? What do you believe he's at work in your life doing? What is it that you're desperate to see him do? Now this is where we're gonna take a few minutes and we're just gonna pray because we're gonna turn our ear to the Father. And we're going to let him tell us, Paul, this is what I want to do in your life. Will, this is what I want to do for you. Diane, this is what I want to do for you. It may be something, Margaret, that you've been praying for for the longest time. Or it may be something new that the Holy Spirit will just drop down in your spirit this morning or this evening. It may be several things. But as we sing this, I want you to hear, and as you hear, I want you to write it down. In 2017, I am believing God for. Here's what I'm believing, and you write it down. If it's one thing, if it's two things, if it's three things, if it's four, write it down. What are you believing God for? Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. If you're watching at home, I want you to do the same thing. Grab a piece of paper. Write down what you hear God telling you. What is it that you are believing God for? Write it down and put it in an envelope. Set that envelope aside. Oh, Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you
finish writing what it is that you are believing God for, I want you to take it and put it in the envelope that you just address to yourself and seal the envelope. In a moment, we're going to come and we're going to bring these along with our tithes and our offerings, and we're going to worship the Lord with these. We're going to lift them up before God, and we're going to say, I believe God for this. I believe God for for this and they're going to listen and he's going to say well right thinking will result in right behavior some of you may have written on here financial breakthroughs and if you did I'm going to tell you to be a hilarious giver some of you have written on here a spouse that's what you want that's what you're that's what you're believing God for if that's what you believe God for, then make sure you start being a companion for somebody. Whatever it is that you are asking for, remember what the Word says. Give, and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over with good measure will God cause other men to heap back to your bosom. Does everybody have your, your, what you're praying for written down? And once you are certain of it, seal your envelope. It's going to ask you to get your offering out. And in just a moment, when we come to the altar at the end, you can drop your offering into the basket here. Thank you, Jesus. If your envelope, can I ask you to, if you've already filled out your envelope and everything filled out, can I ask you to stand as we sing? Come down here. Hold on to your envelope for just a moment until we have everybody at the altar. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Just hold on to your envelopes for a moment. Before you. your hand and say, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord,
few more moments while we're waiting on folks. Oh, Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire, Lord. This is my desire. Come on, y'all. To honor. Y'all, come on. Come on, folks. Come on up. To honor. Do you believe him for these things? Do you believe him for these things? Because what we're going to do is come about December the 15th of next year, I'm going to drop these back in the mail to you. And I'm looking forward to hearing the answers on the first service of 2018 when you walk in here and say, oh, pastor, I didn't know when I wrote that down how he would do it, but I believed you when you said that I'll see it when I believe it, and so I believe it, and now I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. I see the answer that what I've been praying for has come to Jesus. The healing I've longed for has come. That spouse I've been praying for is here. The healing of my body has come. The deliverance of a loved one from drugs or alcohol. I see it. I see it. I want you right now, church, to make up your mind with me. Right thinking will always result in right behavior, but you must choose it. You must choose to say, I choose it. I choose it. Come on. I choose it. Tell it to your spirit right now so you hear it. I choose it. I choose to believe. I choose to believe you, God, for these things. I believe you, God, for breakthrough. Breakthrough. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus in these things. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I believe your word, O oh Father, today. All things are possible to those who believe. All things are possible to those who believe. Some of you wrote burdens down that you have carried for years on these papers. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We're going to take your burden to the Lord, and we're just going to leave it there. You are about to place it in his hand. You've set your mind in the right thing. Now, I promise you what will happen. The Holy Spirit is going to start whispering and say, now go do X, Y, and Z. And it won't make a lick of sense to you. You will be tempted to pick up the phone and call me and say, I think I heard I'm supposed to do this, but that can't be right. Don't call me. Do it. Obey. Because faith without works is dead. Come on, lift your envelopes before the Father. Father, you see these needs that we have written down, and these are the things which we believe you for in 2017, in our year of grace, in the year where you will make all things new. And so, Father, leaving yesterday behind and looking steadfastly towards the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ, I set my face like a flint, and I believe you for these things. Father, I heard you tell me these things, and so I wrote them down. Now, Father, speak to me that I may know what it is that you would have me to do, and that, Lord, as you speak it to me, let me do it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. As I come by, drop your envelope in the basket. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.
Well, this year, coming back December, I remember Pastor Johnny used to do this to us back in Pasadena, and it would never cease to amaze me, Brother Sisto, that when that mail would show up, oh, about the 20th, right before Christmas, at first I'd get this envelope, and I wouldn't have a return address, but I recognized the hand, I'm like, what in the world is that? And then I would open it. What a beautiful Christmas present at that point to see what God has done. Amen. Now we're going to wait on you for our tithes and for our offerings. We're going to start the year off right. We're going to set this year to be the year where we give with hilarity to our King because we're going to break that cycle of poverty in this church in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let there be abundance in my house, is what the Word says. We are not the people of lack. We are not. What a horrible testimony. We are not the people of lack. We are the people who walk in the abundance of God. And so as you give, I'm going to challenge you this coming year. Every single time you set foot into God's house, whether it's in this one or somewhere else, you make sure you bring a gift and you put it in that offering and you believe God. You're not, you're not giving to get. You're giving because he says to. You're giving because your mind's been changed. And then watch what he'll do as a result of that. Amen? Amen. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, Pastor Ken, pray over our offering today. And I'm going to... Oh, you believe in the Lord for a lot, brother. Good. Amen. Good. Good, 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 good. Come here, Deke, hold that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And as you give, do you believe God to break that spirit of poverty? Yeah. You believe it? You believe it? Yeah. Right thinking results in right behavior. Pray, brother. over these gifts, over this offering, over this time, Father. We know as we give, Lord, in obedience unto you, Father, you will cause the windows of heaven to open, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, we are a people without lack. Father, we are a people of power. We are a people who have been blessed for our Father who are the care of a thousand years, Father. And we proclaim good news. We proclaim riches. We proclaim blessings, Father, upon your people. A cheerful heart, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bring your gifts. Bring your gifts. And as you do, I break that spirit of poverty in Jesus' name. And I believe in God for financial prosperity and breakthrough. Checks in the mail in Jesus' name. We believe God. 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 Hallelujah. If you need to give by card, I'll meet you in the back in just a moment. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Oh, I could go on for a long time, but some of y'all got to work in the morning. I 
I'm off tomorrow. So. Uh, praise God. All right. Last final things. We're closing around the word 90 days. Reading plans are out in the lobby. How many of you will make a commitment? You'll read with us every day. Come on. All right. Very good. It ain't that hard, I promise. Getting through numbers might be a little challenging, but after a minute, honey, if you hadn't read Genesis and Numbers, you hadn't read that juicy gossip that's all up in there. I mean, unmentionable. All right, so if you like drama, Genesis is for, for you. All right. Sunday, we start the book of Romans. All right, so we're going to spend... Uh, 13 weeks going through the book of Romans, and Romans 1 will be very interesting next week as we talk about those who exchanged, those who exchanged the divine for the profane, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. We'll end with chapter 2, verse 1, and such as those were you. That was you. All right. Sunday school is another great habit to be in. We have a beautiful Sunday school room all set up for you. Kendrick tells me he promises that class will start promptly at 10 a.m. Be in it. How are we going? Because the only way you're going to start absorbing the word is get more of it and more of it and more of it. Sunday morning at 11 is the next service. Tuesday at 7.30 is prayer meeting. If we have a time around here, Tuesday night certainly was good. Pastor Ken does some teaching as long with prayer. Sunday at 11, uh, we're Sunday school at 10. And then our next Sunday night service on the first Sunday of February. So the first Sunday, we'll go back to first Sundays, first Sunday live, 6 p.m. every first Sunday of the month, in addition to the 11 a.m. service. That will be, that will, that time is for, as you can hear tonight, it is more in-depth, it is teaching, it is discipleship, and we are going to work very diligently this year to put the word down deep in you. Gateway will be a word church. We're going to be them people. All right. So, and yes, Facebook friends, that will be live streamed as well. So, all right. I've kept you long. Thank you for being in the house of God on the first. Don't you, aren't you glad you started the new year, right? I know churches that canceled their whole services today. And we couldn't do that. At least I'll let you sleep in a little bit. All right. Well, praise God. Let's pray. Let's believe God as we get ready to leave this place. Come here, Deke Diane. Come. Come up hither. <laughs> you look so, so sheepishly every time when I say, I love this lady. Thank God. Thank God. All right, pray, and then I'll offer the benediction. Father, thank you for allowing us once again to come into your house to start this new year in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. And Father, we, we leave here tonight with expectation in our heart of, of what you're going to be doing for us individually and for us as Gateway of Hope in this coming year. And now I just ask that you take what's been given to us this evening and and really minister it and speak to us even in this coming few days that we remember and we we act on it because we need the word we need to stand on the word and now go be go go with us tonight as we go home and bring us back safely during the week for prayer meeting and for Sunday service we'll give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus name and so I say over you, may the Lord, for the first time in 2017, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Declare it with me. Our worship is not over. Our service is just beginning. Let us be the people of God. Amen. Woo! All right.
Hold up again. No, no, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, absolutely. 